All right, now, I uh, had a few financial difficulties and needed to get some additional equipment to make this recording properly. Now, last week, or should I say the week before last, we dealt with regeneration, imputation, and adoption. If you have any questions on those subjects, please give me a call at 571-238-6894. Now, the unit goal for this class is to gain a knowledge of the object, methodology, results, and terminology of God's salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And the lesson goal is that upon completion of this lesson, the student will recognize the significance of prayer and living the redeemed life. And our instructional objectives that upon completion of this lesson, every student of the Antioch Bible Institute will be able uh, to um, identify the following categories. Number one, to identify the components of prayer. Number two, to identify the reasons for prayer. Number three, to describe the practical uh, how-to of prayer. Number four, to identify the hindrances of prayer. And then finally, number five, to describe, to describe the proper attitude in prayer. And the lesson uh, presentation, uh, let me start off uh, with uh, this opening um, paragraph for our lesson tonight. Not only is salvation theologically uh, in nature, um, let me read that again. Not only is salvation theological in nature, involving some deep truths of God, but it also has some very practical aspects for our day-to-day -day lives. One of those is prayer, supplication, or uh, prayer is the subject of the believer's life. It has been stated that Satan fears nothing more than he does a surrendered saint in prayer. Prayer is not only the means of going through the door of salvation, but also the means of continued growth and blessing after salvation. All of our failures in the Christian life are prayer failures. I've often told the people at the Mount Calvary Baptist Church that around every um, drought in the life of a Christian, there is also a drought in their prayer life. Prayer life is very important. Prayer is not only the means of going through the door of salvation, but also the means of continued growth and blessing after salvation. All of our failures in the Christian life are prayer failures. We do well to give such attention to the subject of prayer. In tonight's lesson, we will study a number of major factors about prayer with a view towards improving our walk as the redeemed of the Lord. Now, first we're gonna deal with this word supplication, which is another term that is used for the subject of prayer. First question, what is prayer? I hope you see that on your outline. First, prayer is the simplest definition, uh, uh, is simply having fellowship with, or I think I added conversation with God. Number two, the disciples prayer, which is the Lord's prayer, gives us the key elements which compromise prayer a personal relationship with God, our Father. Starts with faith. Listen, faith. 
Not only are you claiming the personal relationship with God because the Lord's prayer, or really you could say the disciples prayer, actually starts off with our father. There's a relationship there. And then it goes from a personal relationship to faith. It says, which art in heaven? Uh, I found out recently, someone shared with me that trust is a form of worship. Faith, which art in heaven? And then worship. Notice this prayer says, hallowed be thy name. That's worship. Holy, hallowed, reverent, um, hallowed be thy name. And then from worship, we go to expectation. Thy kingdom come. Now, in that expectation, it shows that our secular and carnal mindset needs to be evacuated before we have a successful prayer life. In that expectation, it's not our will, but his will be done. So it says, thy kingdom come. Your most successful prayer life will be within the parameters of the kingdom, God's kingdom. Then we go from expectation to submission. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Again, from expectation to submission. Your prayer life needs to be embedded within the word, the will, and the way of God. Thy kingdom come and then thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Some people who are most frustrated with prayer have a secular lifestyle that they want to interpose upon God rather than submitting themselves to the kingdom of God. From submission, we go to petition. Give us this day our daily bread. I used to ask, why don't we just pray once a year and say, Lord, give us this, uh, these next 365 days bread each day. Well, the reason why is that God doesn't only want you to have the bread of life. He wants you to know the bread of life. That's the petition. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not like ordering something and have it automatically delivered every three months on Amazon. It's a relationship. It is also a petition that gives fellowship. From petition, we go to confession and forgive us our debts. In other words, forgive us uh, our trespasses, forgive us our sins. We like sheep have gone astray. Forgive us our debts. First John chapter one, verse nine. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So you go from that petition of daily bread to confession and forgive us our debts. Uh, not only forgive us uh, of our sins, but also forgive us of how we have impacted others. Confession goes to compassion as we forgive our debtors. We're basically saying here, Lord, don't forgive me any more than I am willing to forgive someone else. We go from confession and compassion to dependence. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some people have a case of what I call hypo-holy religitude. They are so busy being holy and so busy singing praises. They're so busy acting as if they are holier than anyone else. They're not just God's witness. They are God's key witness. They think that they've never done anything wrong. And the first words out of their mouth was, Jesus, keep me near the cross. But no, he says here that not only should we forgive our debts, we should ask that God will forgive our debtors. Not only how we impact the lives of others, but how those impact our lives. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Then uh, the prayer goes on to acknowledgement. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now we go to what is called the reasons for prayer. Why should we pray? Number one, because of the repeated command of God. There's a Greek word here that is called, uh, let me check this out, ade adoros, dos, yeah. All day adoros, ade adoros. I keep trying to say rose, but it's dos. Here is translated in the Greek, without ceasing. Notice Paul says, pray without ceasing and elsewhere given a simply continually. Uh, the last time we taught class, we talked about the fact that if I was to go to work with you, we wouldn't talk all day on the commute to your job. We wouldn't talk all day during your work day because you have work to do. But occasionally you would just say things to me and it would also suggest relationship because we're talking throughout the day. Pray without ceasing, pray continually. Uh, this does not refer to a marathon, nonstop prayer, but simply that you're talking to God, you're fellowshipping with God throughout the day. It seems rather to refer to an attitude of dependence upon God which ceases, uh, well, not ceases, it uh, seems uh, rather to refer to an attitude of dependence upon God with, which uh, causes one to constantly flee to prayer. This kind of uninterrupted flow of the heart to God keeps our values in line and balances the temporal and, and the eternal. Number two, because of the example of Christ, if the son of God himself needed to pray, how much more do we? Uh, uh, how often one finds our Lord in the gospel accounts reporting to uh or should I say resorting to the quiet place for prayer? Because of the example of the early church, not only the example of Christ, but the example of the early church, the early Christians knew the secret of tapping into the power of God for their lives and service. Uh, through prayer, they saw the lost saved, miracles performed, uh, and had deliverance from their enemies. Number four, because prayer is God's chosen method for the following. A, defeating the devil because we were uh, crucified, risen, ascended, and seated with Christ in heavenly places. The church has authority over Satan, yet how many Christians today have allowed him to get a foothold and build strong holes in their lives, defeating them? B, saving the sinner, the repentant prayer of the publican pleaded the propitiation of Christ. Um, C, restoring the backslider. What a joy it is to know that when we have, uh, when we sin against our Lord, no matter how far away from him we are, there is always only one step to the cross and the blood of cleansing. D, strengthening the saint. Not only should we pray for ourselves to grow, but spending time in prayer is growth. Perhaps one of the reasons why so many of God's people exhibit so little growth is the result of our failure to pray 
one for another. E, sending forth laborers. So important is the element of church life that the early church gave itself to prayer along with fasting before sending their workers forth. Uh, I think in the military that call that's called to be deployed. Um, then we could talk about rules of engagement, but that's another uh, lesson. <laughs> Uh, sadly, today, the church often resorts to gimmicks and uh, Madison Avenue hype rather than fervent prayer and fasting. Uh, causing the sick, um, which actually that's curing the sick, while God is pleased to use medicine uh, to affect healing, which is probably involved in this passage, Yet, the bottom line is that prayer of faith is essential. God does still provide healing and answers to prayer. Next, glorifying God's name. Number one, prayer itself coming from the heart of the adoring saint is a sweet fragrance to God. This scripture seems to indicate that our prayers are collected and contained in heaven. Can you imagine that repository of collected prayers? Accomplishing the impossible. Despite the relative unbelief of his people today towards him, God's uh, specialty is still the impossible. He delights uh, to answer the prayer of these who could trust him uh, for great things which they know not. Number two, such prayer glorifies him because it realizes how great and mighty he really is and trust him in the impossible situation. Next, uh, the advantage of prayer is giving good things. Prayer is not some sort of uh, battering ram uh, used to beat down the gates of glory and get God's attention. Rather, it avails us of his already willing heart to bless us uh, when we are in the place of communion uh, so that we can, uh, do so. I get so sick of these prayers that are always asking God for a blessing. And yet those blessings are dealing with, uh, mansions and maids, Mercedes and money and mutual funds. We, our prayer life, uh, God can bless us with anything he wants to bless us with, but our prayer life needs to be in communion with God's will and right now there's a lot of things that needs to be done and everyone is praying these prayers that uh, are part of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Uh, so imparting wisdom, each of us often faces problems uh, for which we must have wisdom far beyond ourselves. What a delight to know what the storehouse of God's wisdom in Christ is available and only a prayer away. Next, uh, letter K is bestowing peace. Peace is not something one works up, but something one receives. Many Christians today occupy hospital beds who should not simply uh, because they have failed to receive his peace through prayer. And, you know, it is true that uh, certain illnesses are brought on by stress, and those stresses are brought on by the fact of not being able uh, to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is long-suffering and self-control and peace. And uh, the all in all is just the DNA of love. Also, uh, keeping one from sin, God has promised that 
no temptation will be more than we can bear. And so when we fall into sin, it is our prayer failure and not claiming the resources of God which are available to us. Next, revealing the will of God. God desires that uh, we know uh, his will for more uh, than we desire to know it. Prayer is one great means of expressing our desire to him to know what he would have us to do. Because of the example of the greatest Christian of all time, it's the next category uh, that we should look at. Again, because of the example of the greatest Christian of all time. This is amazing today that people are angry with Paul because Paul debunks a lot of things that people want to add to the church that Paul has already said is not glorifying God or not God's will or something that we should do. People love Paul in the book of Romans, but I don't even know of a preacher. He did a series, a sermon series on the book of Romans and he skipped chapter one and chapter two and started in chapter three. I wonder why. But Paul was one of the greatest Christians in the history of scripture. Uh, God went through uh, great um, efforts to bring Paul into the body of Christ. The same one who persecuted the church was also the one who wrote the majority of the New Testament. The apostle Paul knew the value of prayer as perhaps uh, none other who had ever lived in this church age. Not only was he faithfully in prayer for others, but he often requested prayers of others for himself. The spiritual deaths of Paul's prayers recorded in the scriptures reveal how much he used the tool of prayer in communion with the Father. C the practical, how to, the how to of prayer. Number one, the direction of prayer, to whom should we pray? Prayer should be made to the Father, through the Spirit, in the name of Jesus. To the Father, through the Spirit, in the name of Jesus. One should understand this as the theological approach of prayer based on the work and role of each member of the Trinity. The late Dr. John R. Rice, a great prayer warrior, was once accosted for addressing the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. His reply I know the whole family. Hmm. Number two, the objects of prayer. For whom should we pray? Now, here's a list. Uh, you know, sometimes I get brain fog in the middle of my prayer. But this list is very helpful. Pray for ourselves. Pray for one another. Pray for our pastor. Pray for pastors, pray for sick believers, pray for rulers, pray for our enemies, pray for Israel. That's a pretty good list. And there, there's other categories you could add on, but this is a good list for ourselves, for others, for our pastors, uh, for sick believers, for rulers, for our enemies and for Israel. Definitely <laughs> pray for Israel. Uh, what happened on October the 7th was terrible, but it is spreading to a major war throughout the entire Middle East. Uh, you could really call this period of life of 2024 uh, footsteps 
towards Armageddon. Footsteps toward Armageddon. For all people, such an overwhelming list simply preserves, uh, excuse me, for all people, such an overwhelming list simply serves to indicate the great need and the view of God for us to pray about every kind of need and situation. I, I know myself, I prayed for a good parking space and God answered that prayer. But there's other things of greater importance that we also should pray about. While it is impossible humanly for us to pray for everyone and everything effectively, we must be willing and ready to labor in prayer over those uh, prayer assignments which the Holy Spirit would give us. That's another thing about prayer. The Holy Spirit will add to your prayer even while you are praying. Then we have the positions of prayer. And what posture should we pray? Now, I know one thing. I don't think it's on the list here. But have you ever prayed on 395? Uh, I suggest if you pray on 395 that you keep your eyes open. But uh, there is need for prayer on the highway. <laughs> the parkway, <laughs> down the street, in the neighborhood, <laughs> even pulling out of your, your driveway, you, <laughs> you need to pray. And the Wilmington's God uh, for the Bible, uh, page 830, uh, section number seven, several different positions are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, often the position reflects the heart attitude and depth of the need of one praying. You can pray standing. You can pray sitting. Notice that sitting, that standing could be during rush hour. You standing on the bus. Are you standing on the subway? Are you sitting on the bus? Are you sitting on the subway? Standing, sitting, uh, bowing, uh, laying down. It says lying, but that in, implies that you're a politician. But if you're laying down, not lying, but if you're li laying down, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good time to pray. Prostated, that means you just laid out on the floor, just praying. You can be uh, laying out on your bed as well and just open your heart to the Lord. Uh, on one's face, on one's knees. These are all good positions of praying. In the hospital bed, in the doctor's office, in the courtroom. <laughs> Uh, with the with uh, the faith between the knees, there is no yet posture God requires for prayer, and often the pros the posture uh, we assume is often out of habit. Perhaps the uh, church today truly needs to be on its face before the Lord uh, in repentance for the indifference and rebellion. Uh, which so characterize our age. Now, at this point, I'm going to turn uh, the recording off and turn it right back on. I would hate to have done all of this and um, then lose the recording. And right now, my battery is low. So let me turn this off. <laughs> 